Good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, call to order the May 16th, 2023 public hearing for the City of Tampa's Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome, everyone. I am Vivian Solaga, chair of the HPC. Uh, if you are here to present a request, please be thorough but concise. At the microphone, identify yourself and your relationship to the project before you begin your presentation. The commissioners will not ask any questions during your presentation. Then staff will present their report. Then we will ask for public comment. If you are speaking during public comment, Please state and spell your name clearly if you are here to speak for or against a particular project. Your time will be limited to three minutes, so take time to summarize your comments because these three minutes go very quickly. Following the public comment, the applicant will have five minutes for rebuttal. Then commissioners will ask questions of the applicant and the staff. The public hearing will then be closed. The only comments that will be allowed after the public hearing is closed will be in response to any questions from the commissioners. The commissioners will then discuss the case and will make their decision based on the city ordinance chapter 27 of the city zoning code and the testimony given at this public hearing. The HPC can only act on items that are within our specific jurisdictional responsibility. Owners and agents are independently responsible to obtain any appropriate permits and or approvals. If you haven't already done so, please silence your cell phones. Um, I will now ask the commissioners to introduce themselves, beginning on my far right. Tom Buckeye, University of Susan Swift, Boggs Engineering and Boggs Design Partners. Dominique Cobb, Vice Chair, Urban Planner. Carrie Ann Kanch. Um, Missy Shoecraft. Um, Preservationist. With us today from the preservation staff is Dennis Fernandez, Elaine Lund, Alexis Goodman, Guzman, sorry, and our legal counsel, counsel Camaria Pettis Mackle. We have the um, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, that were forwarded to us and are in our packet. Are there any comments or questions regarding those minutes? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the March 21st, 2023 minutes. I second. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Minutes are approved. We have announcements, please. Good morning, Commissioner Dennis Fernandez, Architect Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Welcome to today's public hearing and welcome to uh, our applicants and to the public who have joined us. Uh, uh, just one um, announcement uh, just to re-emphasize that there has been a revision to our meeting calendar um, because of a conflict with this uh, room. Uh, we did have to adjust our July. Uh, it is uh, now uh, scheduled 
Good morning, Commissioners. Kamaria pettis Mackle from the City Attorney's Office. Will the Commissioners state whether or not they have any conflicts of interest regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? No, I don't. No. Additionally, will the Commissioners please state whether or not they've had any ex parte communications regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? No. Thank you. Swearing, including staff. I do. Uh, Madam Chair, for item number seven, we do have a speaker who is coming in. He has not arrived yet. Uh, so if it's the pleasure of the board, uh, we could uh, perhaps uh, switch seven for eight and take HPC 2023-01 first on the agenda. I, th I think that would be fine. Can we just have a motion? A motion. To, uh, okay. Uh, All right. I move that we um, amend the agenda to delay item seven. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? And if we could just have our um, digital media staff put on the presentation for item number eight uh, uh, for the agenda. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Elaine Lund, uh, Historic Preservation Staff. If you can just give me a moment, we'll get this presentation up for you. So this item this morning um, for HBC 2023-01 is the redesignation of a contributing structure in the Hyde Park Historic District. I think the presentation is ready now. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the structure was uh, originally located at 815 South Rome Avenue and was moved within the Hyde Park Historic District to 910 South Fremont Avenue. This was a house that was built circa 1923 in the <clears throat> excuse me, um, Dutch colonial revival architectural style. You're here this morning under um, the, what our code provides for your powers and duties to review designations of contributing status and changes in status when requested to do so by an applicant. We have received an application um, from the property owner to change the status back to contributing in this case. So therefore, we look at section 27-261, which um, gives us the criteria to review such applications. And this criteria to be applied by you in approving or not approving the application um, to change the contributing status is set forth under National Register Bulletin number 15. So I'll be going over those criteria as we move through the presentation. <clears throat> So showing you the, here is the, um, the 1931 Sanborn map of this section of the Hyde Park Historic District. The 815 South Rome Avenue is um, outlined in green for you, and it was relocated to the site that's shown outlined in red at 910 South Fremont Avenue. You can see that at that time, uh, that was a, a vacant lot on the site on Fremont. This is the 2022 aerial map. Again, with the, uh, the original site at 815 South Rhone shown in green and the relocation site at 910 Fremont shown in red. Um, at this time, there was a building, uh, two buildings actually located on the site, a non-contributing primary structure and a contributing accessory structure, which is a little unusual. But um, <clears throat> the... ARC reviewed this application and did make the approval to relocate this, um, this building and to demolish the existing non-contributing primary structure on the site while retaining the uh, contributing accessory structure. So this map shows um, where these buildings are located within the Hyde Park Historic District. <clears throat> 
The building um, at 815 South Rome Avenue in 2018 looked much as it did in um, 1944 from this uh, newspaper advertisement of the house for sale. The house was relocated in 2021. Um, here you're seeing parts of it <laughs> as it was taken apart in uh, multiple pieces to be moved around the corner and down the street. Um, the picture on the right shows the building after it had been uh, reassembled on the site, but you can still see the um, sort of the lines in the building from where it was cut up into different, different pieces to be moved. On the um, pictures on this slide, we're seeing the house as it was being rehabilitated in 2021 on the bottom left, and then on the right and how it looked following the rehabilitation in 2023. This is the um, existing accessory structure that was on site. This building was, in fact, um, raised to allow an increase in the first floor interior ceiling height, and a one-story garage bay addition was added to its um, south side there, and you can see that in the picture on the right. The 1988 Hyde Park Historic District Local Designation Report um, at the time that the Hyde Park Historic District was um, adopted by ordinance by the City of Tampa, um, Section 43A-154 of the City's Code laid out the criteria for designation and for a historic district. And it's um, the period of significance needed to be greater than 50 years. So at that time, um, the period of significance for the historic district was found to be 1886 to 1933. The um, historic district met criterion one, that its character was um, had a geographically definable area possessing a significant concentrations of buildings that are well designed and other structures, sites and objects united by past events or by a plan or physical <coughs> development. And also it met criterion two, that its character as an established and geographical definable, geographically definable neighborhood united by culture, architectural styles, or physical development. In the 1985 Hyde Park Historic District National Register of Places report um, has very similar criteria, however, uh, you know, worded differently for the, uh, the National Register rather than for the local designation. Uh, maintained the same period of significance, 1886 to 1933. Um, National Register Criterion B was found to be met, that there were associations with the lives of persons important in our past, and Criterion C that embodied, um, that the district embodied the distinctive characteristics of a tight period of method of construction that represent the work of a master that possess high artistic values or that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction. And it's that last part there that really um, refers to historic districts. And then it was found to be significant under those criteria in the areas of architecture, community planning, development, and settlement. Um, as I stated earlier, the ARC did approve the relocation of this building. That was done on November 4th in 2020. Um, the application criteria for this particular um, application for a redesignation of the contributing status of a relocated building, um, the application criteria were found to be met and the, the complete application was received by the owner on February 22nd of this year. And National Register Bulletin 15 um, which our code refers us to, finds that the building contributes to the integrity of the Hyde Park Historic District because it was built within the period of significance of the district, being built in 1923, and that it embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type of architecture represented throughout Hyde Park, and it maintains its historic relationship to its site and setting, being within the historic district and having been only relocated um, a couple of blocks. Our staff recommendation is that 910 South Fremont Avenue meets the application criteria of our code and the criteria found in National Register Bulletin 15, that it's a historic resource that maintains the character and integrity of the Hyde Park Historic District. Therefore, staff recommends approval 
of this request to redesignate the status of this building as contributing and recommends the amendment of the Hyde Park Historic District Building Inventory. Um, with that, I believe the agent for the owner is here this morning and um, can come forward and provide additional information. Thank you. Good morning, Truett Gardner, 400 uh, North Ashley Drive. Here on behalf of John and Susan Tushton, this has been a three and a half year journey that we have walked along with Elaine and Dennis and his team, and we're honored to present this redesignation. Uh, this house is 100 years old, and it sat kind of at the, the edge of the Hyde Park uh, Historic District, which had intensified over time. So a 100 year old house that really had been neglected it's been painstakingly restored, as Elaine pointed out, for the next 100 years. And uh, so honored to present this for redesignation. Just to add a little bit of color to um, 26, 27261, which refers to National Register Bulletin 15, and in particular A, B, and C. Um, as mentioned, the house was built around 1923, which is 100 years old and also within Hyde Park's period of significance. And then secondly, B, which is <clears throat> the properties associated with the lives of persons significant in our past. The house was built by uh, Herbert Draper, who was the manager of Triumph Coffee Mills. He lived there with his wife, Blanche, until the house was purchased by James G. and Charlotte Yates in 1926. Mr. Yates was, act was an active local uh, businessman and politician, having ser served three terms as the mayor of Port Tampa City and two terms as chairman of the Hillsborough County Commission. And then finally, criteria C, um, the house has a Dutch colonial revival architectural style, which is represented throughout the district. So with that, I'll stand down, but happy to answer any questions you may have. Commissioners, are there any questions of the applicant or the staff? I have a question, um, whether probably for staff, um, if you could just clarify, I, I mean, this is commendable, I think, and uh, my regards to the owners for seeking this designation. But the, the staff summary says it's eligible under A and C, not B and C. The, um, usually when we look at our designation criteria, we're looking for um, how it relates to under National Register Bulletin 15 for this, so that gets to be a little um, different between the what the between the area of significance for the district overall where um, that, that's a is the whole district yes it was previously eligible under b for people in portland in the past but we're dropping well we're not of. we're not dropping it for the the district it's just for the individual structure okay So, and, you the know, structure of course, had that designation. Yeah. I'm just, I, it yeah. doesn't really matter, but I'm trying to clarify. The yeah, structure pre previously had that designation. Right. For this D. particular structure, you know, it was the, the district overall that had the association with the uh, lives of important people uh, okay. for this particular okay. structure. Okay. It's, okay. You know, I understand. Did not find that. Any other questions, commissioners? Is there anyone in the uh, audience who would like to speak on behalf of this project? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and uh, offer up a conversation to the commissioners and or a motion. Comments, questions, none? May I have a motion then, please? Uh, I move to redesignate the property located at 910 South Fremont Avenue as a contributing structure and amend the Hyde Park Historic District building inventory and map because the application does meet the criteria established in the National Register Bulletin 15 for the following reasons. A, uh, property associated with the events that have made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of our history and C, property embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction or represents the work of a master 
or possess high artistic values or represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components lack individual distinction. I second the motion. Okay. Uh, all those in favor signify aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations. Once again, good morning. Commissioners Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. During our um, last uh, hearing on uh, March the 21st, there was some discussion about uh, the uh, local landmark structure, the Jackson House, which is located at uh, 851 East Zack Street. And there was a request for an update on uh, preservation efforts for that particular structure. I was just going to begin but prior to the update just with a, a little orientation for individuals who may not be as familiar with that particular structure. I could go to, um, here we go. PowerPoint for a moment. So the Jackson House is situated uh, downtown on uh, 851 Zack Street. Uh, that is uh, just uh, off of Nebraska Avenue. Uh, you can see uh, the proximity to uh, the Tampa Union Station. It's just off to the east uh, from the Jackson House. Uh, Jackson House was a segregation era boarding house and much of its occupancy uh, resulted from the uh, Jim Crow laws that were in place during uh, its period and the fact that uh, the segregated uh, residency for occupants had to occur between uh, racial divides and this particular um, boarding house catered to the black community at that time. Just some facts. Uh, it was established in 1899 by uh, Moses Jackson and it remained uh, in the uh, Jackson family, the Jackson Robinson family, uh, until it was uh, eventually transferred to the Jackson House Foundation in 2014, um, of which the Robinson family remains active, the Jackson Robinson family remains active on that particular foundation. Uh, it was designated as a, a City of Tampa local landmark in 2004, and it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2007 for uh, ethnic her uh, heritage for the uh, black uh, history of the city. See some of the photos uh, and the condition of the structure. In recent years, the, uh, the house has fallen into disrepair. There is a um, structural system interior to the house that was uh, funded uh, uh, through a grant by the Tampa Bay Lightning uh, to the Jackson House uh, Foundation that essentially uh, somewhat uh, stabilized the deterioration, but obviously the exterior deterioration is, is fairly dramatic. And with that, I'm going to invite Elise Drumgo, who is the city's Deputy Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity, to the podium and he'll uh, provide an update for you. Thank you. Dennis, excuse me, will we need to swear uh, him in, please? Uh, I, I think for him and for anybody else that may have walked in after the swearing. All right, anyone who has entered the room after the initial swearing in, please rise and raise your right hand for swearing in. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Elise Drumgo, Deputy Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity. Uh, as staff mentioned, uh, you know, the Jackson House, uh, we've been working on this uh, now for several years, I would say, and uh, uh, also doubling as your, uh, as part of the redevelopment agency, I've been working on this project as well. So uh, just for your background information, uh, we've been discussing and negotiating the potential easement and fire separation uh, for the site uh, in order to support the preservation of the Jackson House. So um, I won't get into too much detail about the negotiations itself, but 
I do want to let you all know that we are actively working on it, and, and I think that we're getting uh, fairly close uh, to a resolution relative to the easement necessary to, to support that preservation. Um, this Thursday, we do have several items on the City Council agenda that are related to a grant uh, to support the restoration of the Jackson House. Uh, that grant is a total of $500,000 to be paid over two years, and the city and city staff will support the administration of that grant. So uh, we have to create that mechanism for uh, the city to do that in an agreement between the city and the Jackson House Foundation supported uh, through the state uh, to receive those funds to be able to administer those over uh, the two-year period. And it's set up so that there will be four payments uh, through uh, to the foundation over the course of that two-year period for progress payments. So uh, that'll take us through the initial construction documents through 30, 60, and then 100% uh, plan sets and com through completion. Um, so with that, you know, I'll, I'll stand for any questions that you may have, but uh, I'll say that we are actively working on that and we hope to bring an update back to you in the coming month or so. Well, thank you. Um, it's good news for sure. This poor little house has been sitting there wasting away for so many years. Are there any questions of Mr. Drumdo from the, uh, from the commissioners? Greetings, Mr. Drumdo. Thank you so much for uh, working with this project. We know that the Jackson House is just not a boarding house or a little house. This was a place that African Americans could go to when they had nowhere else to go. So I'm excited that the city has uh, come together with funds to uh, hopefully get this project restored as quickly as possible. Um, looking at the pictures that staff showed, um, it's great to see what has happened, but the current condition of the house, I'm, I'm scared, you know, storm season is, hurricane season is very close. And I went by there Sunday and I was actually scared to stand on the sidewalk because pieces were falling down. So hopefully um, soon we can come back with updates so that the home can be stabilized and eventually it can be turned into a place where there is museum and the history is shown throughout that area. Because not only is the Jackson House a part of the um, just that street, but is a part of a community that plays into Encore and other areas um, down Nebraska. So thank you again for your um, contributions and hopefully soon the Jackson House Foundation can come in and give an update on what they're working on, even if they need community support because there is community support there, but there is no way that the community can get in contact with Jackson um, Foundation. So if there is any information that could be provided um, for a volunteer or any other organizations that would like to pair, I would hope that we can have some information available. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank and I, I hear you loud and clear. It sounds like you do want to hear from the foundation itself as well. And so, you know, as we've negotiated between the private property owner and the foundation, um, you know, our goal towards the end of it, once we do reach that resolution, is to bring back the update and then also to appropriately, you know, share via the press, like what we, uh, how we intend to get to the end game on the preservation and what that timeline may be. Thank you. Sure. I, I have one more comment. Um, <clears throat> good morning and thank you for the update. Um, and I think we would all like to, as the commissioner said, continue to be brought up to speed. I have two questions or comments. The first one is, um, I, I guess I have a concern just in general that the only stabilization has been, not the only, but the primary stabilization has been for the structural integrity on the inside. But as we all know, the original material, which is on the outside, is really, as everybody knows, an incredibly deteriorated condition. And um, when the plans are drawn up to restore this structure, my concern has been for years that the exterior material, which is historic in itself, has not been preserved or protected in any way. And now we have what um, the commissioner mentioned is a, a high level of disrepair. Um, so that, that is just a general concern that um, the foundation and or the city of Tampa have just, in my opinion, not taken care of the outside as well as they probably should have to at least hang on to some historic material. Um, um, so that's just a general uh, comment about that. And then the second one is, 
Are the easements needed in order to, because I, I see the chain link fence, which is very close into the side of the property at the building. Mm -hmm. Is that what the purpose of the easements are, is to basically gain, gain access so that the restoration work can be performed? Well, so it, there's a, there are a combination of factors. There's the easement for the, the actual construction, so there will be, need to be a temporary construction easement. Uh, to allow for the access, the staging uh, for mm -hmm. the actual restoration, but then there's also uh, some long-term easement to allow for the continued preservation of the structure itself. So um, for us, I, I think we're all on the same page about the temporary construction easement. It's relative to the long-term uh, post and, and what that what amount of space needs to be provided to the house and how we achieve that. So that's where uh, we're really in the weeds on that right now. We've gone through several rounds of uh, discussion and plan revisions in order to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, what is the proposed use for the building, if there is one in mind? For the house itself? Yeah. Uh, it's my understanding that it, you know, it's it's like a, almost like a museum, right? Is what what the intent is is to preserve and to allow for folks to flow and circulate uh, through the facility to see. Uh, and, and engage with the history. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, and we, uh, we hope there is great success in the near future on this project. As do we. We'll keep at it. Thank you. Moving on now uh, to item number nine on the agenda, the uh, Johnson Brothers Houses. Uh, good morning once again, Commissioners. Uh, what we would like to do and what we recommend is that we open up uh, item number 9 and 10 uh, at the same time uh, because they are uh, abutting properties and we can explain process as we get into the presentation. Okay. May I have a motion to open 9 and 10 simultaneously, please? We'd like to make a motion to open uh, item both 9 and 10 and combine for Commissioners. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes. Thank you, Commissioners. Elaine Lund, Historic Preservation Staff. Um, <clears throat> these items are um, HBC 2023-03 and 2023-04 for the Johnson Brothers Houses, um, which are two buildings located at 20 I'm sorry 1248 and 1250 East Scott Street you can see on your screen here um, the pictures of the current conditions of the two structures 1248 I believe being on your left and 1250 on your right <clears throat> this morning um, you were here under your powers and duties to review and make recommendations to City Council on this nomination um, that we've received by, the, or I'm sorry, you're here to review and make a recommendation on this nomination that you've received for the designation of a landmark. Um, landmark sites, multiple property designations, historic conservation overlay districts or historic districts. In this case, we're bringing forward two buildings that we're proposing to be landmark designated as additions to the historic Central Avenue area slash African-American heritage sites multiple property group. Um, the standard of review is also found in the code under section 27257, which is what you will use to make your recommendation to city council. And I will review that section of the code as we go through the presentation. Um, the photo you're looking at here is of <clears throat> a portion of um, Tampa known as the scrub, which largely um, no longer exists in such form that you see here. The building that is remaining um, is the church that you can see in this picture, and that is the um, St. James Episcopal Church on North Governor Street. <clears throat> the historic Central Avenue area slash African American Heritage Sites multiple property listing currently includes buildings that are um, substantial structures that were important in the daily life of um, this neighborhood and to Tampa's um, black community in the early part of the 20th century. 
Um, these were substantial structures made out of brick um, as opposed to the wood frame structures that surrounded them. Um, the uh, construction and their architectural styles represented the stability, permanence, and success of um, these institutions in the community. These were designated as a group, as um, a landmark group, multiple property listing in 2004. So today we're looking at these two houses on East Scott Street. This is the current aerial map of the property. Um, they're located on the same um, parcel, um, same property parcel, and under the same ownership. Um, currently, Open Space Acquisitions LLC, which um, of which the Tampa Housing Authority is the um, the sole member. These buildings, we are estimating, were constructed around 1900. They first appear on the 1903 Sanborn Company map. Um, there's no prior Sanborn Company map that exists in this area before 1903. So this is the. Um, it's not surprising that they show up on the 1903 map as it's the first one available in the area at the time. Um, and clearly did not cover all of the scrub and we can see on the later map, the 1915 one, that the area that was known as the scrub, which is um, in this area south of, about south of K Street between Nebraska and um, between Central Avenue, which you don't see on this map, but you do see Governor on the west, and then um, Cass Street to the, uh, to the very south there, Zach and Cass Streets. Um, but you do see the density of the housing in this neighborhood. It, there were a lot of um, smaller, tight wood frame houses, um, some larger houses that were possibly boarding houses or um, apartments, um, some wood frame churches in this area at that time. The, the, um, the brick churches were built generally a little bit later. And um, occasionally you'll see a small wood frame store or other sort of um, retail um, shop or a restaurant. <clears throat> um, one of Tampa's um, largest early black neighborhoods, the scrub began in the late 19th century as a small settlement supplying houses for nearby lumber mill workers. It was on the outskirts of downtown Tampa, um, kind of far removed from the area that was you know, originally protected by the um, Fort Brook. The conditions in the scrub were described as being pretty modest at best and um, the wood frame structures were quick to deteriorate. Studies from the 1920s, um, such as the um, study of Negro life in Tampa by the Tampa Urban League, the Tampa Welfare League, and the YMCA, and the 1930s by the Federal Writers Projects give us some glimpses of the daily life in this neighborhood. Um, the houses were described as tightly packed together. The streets were not paved. They were dirt roads. Um, you will see frequently uh, lines of laundry hanging in the streets for the um, women who took them washing for work. This was at a time when childcare was not uh, readily available, and especially for black families. Um, so, you know, women had to stay home to do any work to bring an extra income for their family. <coughs> Excuse me. The um, Central Avenue Business District grew up along the edge, the western edge of the scrub. Um, at this time, state and local laws ensured that racial segregation was legally enforceable, um, ensuring that the black people in the city of Tampa could not attend white churches or schools or shop at their businesses, use their same public facilities, or even be buried in the same cemeteries. Um, <clears throat> Some of the businesses that grew up along the edge of the scrub in the um, Central Avenue business district were cigar companies, which provided employment. Um, businesses such as uh, the area's first um, black dentist office, a drugstore, um, which opened in 1913, the Gem Drugstore on Central Avenue, and Clara Fry's Hospital on Lamar Avenue. There are also um, this was the area where several of the local um, black fraternities or fraternal organizations were born, including the Oddfellows Hall, 
Um, at that time, it was impossible for a group of um, African Americans to get a charter for many of the white fraternal organizations. So many of the um, black fraternal organizations were independent of, completely independent of the, uh, the white fraternal organizations. <clears throat> During the, uh, the 1920s land boom and in um, the following years, Central Avenue and the business district surrounded it continued to thrive. Um, you see here a street shot of Central Avenue in the 1960s. Um, <clears throat> the Pyramid or Central Avenue Hotel is uh, the large three-story building in the distance there. Um, this particular structure was advertised in um, the Negro Blue Book. It was a well-known establishment in which people could stay when they um, were in the city of Tampa. Other um, businesses that grew up in this area were like the Central Life Insurance Company, um, which was founded by G.D. Uh, Rogers. He was a very successful local entrepreneur. Um, Dr. Jacob White Sr., whose house we have listed as one of our locally designated uh, landmarks, had his doctor's office in Central and Scott. And um, you know, the community succeeded, um, and its success provided a, um, a sense of community on, from which several organizations like the Tampa Urban League were founded. Um, the Harlem branch of the Tampa Library grew out of the same um, building as the Tampa Urban League on Marion Street. Um, the Helping Hand Day Nursery, as I mentioned earlier, child care was an issue, so that was a um, organization that was founded through the Urban League to provide uh, daycare for you know, young African American children who were too young for school. And the churches, as um, were previously mentioned, many of which had started out with uh, no structure, were being built um, in, in the brick, and which showed their uh, success and permanence of the, um, not only the structures themselves, but also the congregations in the community. The 1950s and 60s were a very difficult time for this neighborhood with um, urban renewal, with um, urban unrest. There were several riots in the 60s um, following the shooting of a teenage boy in this neighborhood. And um, this led to a dramatic change in, in the fabric of the neighborhood. In the 50s, um, architects Franklin of Adams and Frank Partiale designed Central Park Village, which was a low rent complex intended to transform the scrub, which was then seen as um, you know, a, um, a neighborhood that was targeted by, um, by urban renewal and housing. The Tampa Housing Authority um, built this complex with 57 residential units, and only a few houses that were north of Scott Street were to uh, remain. You can see the change here as we look at the, uh, the 1957 aerial map of the area. And the Johnson Brothers houses are still shown there in red, um, just north of, directly north of, you can see the, the barrack style housing project there. Um, these two houses, um, interestingly, we, um, find them listed in the 1950 U.S. Census. Um, and one of them was occupied at the time by Johnny Johnson and his family. Uh, Mr. Johnson worked for a railroad company and he lived with his wife, Luella, and a couple of lodgers that they had in the house. Um, the Johnson family continued, remained in the houses, uh, eventually purchasing them and um, I believe remained in the, you know, owning the homes until the Tampa Housing Authority recently purchased the property. So today, um, the um, the sorry the Central Park Village housing um, 
area was targeted for community redevelopment by the city in June of 2006. They developed the um, plan for the Central Park Community Redevelopment Area. Um, the measures that were included in this redevelopment plan, including the raising of the, the housing project, um, the redesign of Perry Harvey Senior Park, and the construction of a mixed-use community, including affordable and market-rate apartments. And you can see the uh, construction that has occurred um, pretty much to date in this aer aerial photograph. The revised um, Perry Harvey Senior Park is shown there along the left side um, between Central Avenue and Orange Avenue. Um, this encore is accented by um, planned public art, some, much of which has been installed in the park already, and uh, the renovation of the old St. James Church, which uh, you saw in the photograph at the beginning of this presentation. Here are some of the, uh, the photos of the art within the uh, Perry Harvey Senior Park. It's various um, representations, some of the life um, in the scrub and some of the murals, and I believe the mural on the, the bottom left, and forgive me for not knowing all the, the media of the art here, but um, that particular mural represents the life of the scrub, the Central Avenue heyday shown in the photo on the top right and there's um, a history walk that winds throughout the neighborhood, or I'm sorry, throughout the park. So these two houses that we're here to talk about today are um, frame vernacular houses, very simple, rectangular in plan, and have a gable front roof and double hung wood sash windows, which are still intact. Um, they feature some wood corner born and trim, but very little ornamentation otherwise, aside from the um, jigsaw cut um, detailing that you see on the, uh, the porch columns there. When we look at the criteria in section 27257 of our code that uh, speaks to whether or not buildings are, should be considered for landmark designation, first we have to consider whether they've um, achieved significance between um, during the period of, of historic significance, which is generally taken to be of at least 50 years old, and as these buildings were thought to be constructed around 1900, they definitely meet um, that particular criterion. Um, other criteria that our code lists um, in section 27257 are whether the buildings are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, which is also a National Register Criterion A. Um, and we feel that staff feels that these buildings do meet this in the area of community planning and development. Um, and also staff feels that the um, buildings meet the criterion found in um, section 27257A2, that these buildings are associated with the lives of persons significant in our past and the area of ethnic history. And also that these particular buildings under A23 embody the distinctive type, um, is distinctive characteristics of a type of architecture and that um, they are examples of the frame vernacular structures that were found throughout the, um, the scrub area. In fact, they are the only remaining examples that we have of these buildings in this neighborhood. Um, the historic Central Avenue Amer African American Heritage Site's multiple property listing is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of community planning development and Criterion B in the area of African American ethnicity. And um, these buildings that remain are the few that we have left that represent an enclave that formed among um, the African American community starting as early as the turn of the century. They also meet, um, as I stated under Criterion C here for the National Register, they are locally significant as that they exemplify the way of life of a cohesive community that formed around the Central Avenue area. We received the application um, from the property owner in February of 2023. It was a complete application and public notice requirements for this hearing have been met. So 
so staff finds that this property meets the criteria for local historic landmark designation. And our recommendation is that um, you determine to recommend this property for to city council for local historic landmark designation. So as um, Dennis stated, even though we have opened both of these items together, we are requesting two, uh, two motions, one for um, 1248 East Scott Street and one for 1250 East Scott Street this morning. So with that, um, a, the agent and a representative from the Housing Authority are here this morning to speak, and I'm available if you have questions. Thank you. Excuse me, um, Madam Chair, if you could just allow the agent to give her, um, she's here, she's here to give her. Sorry. Please come forward. Hello. I'm Stephanie Farrell, and I'm the agent for this landmark designation process and uh, representing the ownership. And of course, the owners of the owners are also here, uh, represented by uh, David Hollis and Rosanna and Paul Johnson a former owner. Uh, so uh, they are present as well. So I will just make my, my comments brief to say that, uh, to thank Elaine for what I see to be a very complete report. And I'm, I'm impressed with the, uh, with the, uh, with the research that, uh, that has been uh, done and, and shows these buildings in light of their historic and community context. So we would con concur, I would concur as, their, as the historic preservation consultant for this project uh, and, and agree with, uh, with uh, the staff recommendations in terms of the, uh, the National Register criteria being met for this project. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, David or to, to, to just uh, Mr. Johnson first. Okay, excellent. And then I can answer questions about the, the future use of the property as well. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. I appreciate. Could you, know, you excuse uh, me? Could you please state your name and address for the record? Hmm? Ma'am. Just state your name and address. Oh, my name Paul Johnson. I'm my, my name Paul Johnson. I live in Plant City. I don't live on Scott Street anymore. I finally sold my house. And it was a battle with my family and my kids because they said, right now I'm, I'm coming to talk with y'all and I couldn't get them to come because they said that they should have stayed there. Now they want to designate the houses when you leave. So, you know, I'm listening to that. She had a beautiful presentation. She needed to write a book. <laughs> I, could, I could tell her some things. You know, I can tell a lot of y'all some things. Uh, my father grew up in the scrubs, almost right there where the house is. My grandmother, she moved on Fifth Avenue. She lived on uh, across Fifth Avenue and 22nd Street behind the Columbia restaurant. I had an aunt during the time married. A husband name was Norega. I don't want to get into a lot of detail about names and whatever, but you know, it was a battle, it was a fight. You know, so I, I figured my aunt was a small woman. She married a man, whatever he was into, the cigars or whatever Igbo City did. But my father come from the scrub. And uh, like the young lady said here, you know, when the, the urban renewal come in, he went crazy about it. Because he said they just taking us, they taking all we own, all our communities. So, you know, the, uh, the terrible housing, you know, situation, he won, he, my brother passed now, but he wasn't crazy about Tampa Housing because he picked it up from my father saying, well, they coming and they taking again because my father went through this, you know, and, and he wasn't too keen of it. But uh, Central Park, when they built them, they called them the projects. So he said they called them in the projects because they want to see, it's an experiment. Do you want to get out or do you want to stay there? You understand, some people come up in the project, they stayed forever. Some got out. I went to school with uh, some people I won't name, but they doctors now, they lawyers. You know what I'm saying? I don't think they judges or nothing, but, you know. And I'm just listening at her about the area, and my father was lucky. I would say he was blessed to work with the railroad because he made good money. You know, back then, the uh, uh, longshoremen, 
they was almost, if you black, that's top dollar job you can have. So he was a, a railroad man. He made good money. And I remember going to Harbor Island now. It wasn't Harbor Island, it was Southern Island. I know y'all know your history. I hope some of you do, because I, I live in Tampa all my life. The young lady spoke, I'm listening. Y'all, did y'all know where the first St. Joseph Hospital was? Y'all knew where it was on 7th Avenue before you get to Florida? Y'all knew that? I went there just walking by. We couldn't go to the hospital, but it was nuns and priests. They was governed that hospital. You know, when I was a little boy, I come up, and I went through the rides. The, the, the guy that got shot started the rides. I didn't witness it, but I was there. I was in the marching and the whatever, the crest. I mean, Tampa got a lot of history, and y'all going through it. And I'm going to commend y'all. I can stand here and talk to you all day about a lot of things. But the lightning, I don't know if y'all know this neither, but down the way to uh, Amelia Arena, there's a lot of black people back there. A lot of people, y'all knew that too, right? Okay, my father said, you know why they put us down here? Because when the hurricane season come, the, the river flood, we the one got to get out. Okay, if my brother was living here now, he'll say, y'all taking it back now. Before y'all put us down here, because y'all didn't want to live, scared of the water, the danger, the hurricanes, the floods. You hear what I'm saying? And them houses would build up off the ground. My daddy said, if it flood, at least we got a chance, because you're not sitting on the ground. It made sense to me, you know? I grew up in that house 60 some years. I don't care if the hurricane was coming or what was going on. I wasn't moving, because if it stood 100 and some years, it's going to be there longer than I live. My father gone, my mother gone. I'm the last of four children. So I appreciate y'all. I really do. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, do, the, do, do the owners, does the ownership want to speak to this project at all? That David? <laughs> I think this is an important step, and I appreciate you all being here. Certainly. My name is David Hollis. I'm with Tampa Housing Authority. I live in River, Florida. And beginning in 2010, I had the privilege to get to know the Johnsons uh, back when uh, Paul's brother was still here. Mm -hmm. And we became his neighbors. We had a, <clears throat> a construction trailer right there at the corner of Nebraska and Scott when we started to uh, bring Encore back. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm really not going to talk about the history because everything I learned about the history of that neighborhood, I learned on that man's front porch, so or or actually hanging over the fence. So uh, uh, it was it was just a privilege to actually meet some of the local history that we have to uh, maintain here in Tampa for people to know. Uh, there's. There's a whole lot of people that are second generation Tampa people that I know who just don't know that piece of history. And it's an amazing piece of history. The Apollo Dance Club, the Joiners, uh, uh, the Cozy Corner, all that stuff that went on on Central Avenue. When we redeveloped Central Park Village and turned it into the Encore, the second act, because of the rich history and culture that took place in that entire area. Um, although the real Central Avenue kind of runs through the center of Perry Harvey Senior Park, we renamed our primary street there, Ray Charles Boulevard and Central Avenue. Uh, also, uh, we named one of our streets Blanche Armwood, Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. So uh, we wanted to maintain that history by naming that stuff. We maintained the St. James Episcopal Church and that's actually, uh, we just formed a partnership with the Tampa History Museum, and that building is now going to be, uh, we think Tampa's, we aim that it be Tampa's premier African-American cultural museum. So that history is important. The Johnson Brothers' house is important. That the Johnson Brothers' houses are the end of the scrub. There is no more scrub, and it needs to be maintained. So appreciate what you're doing. That was some great, I read it all, the, uh, the history work you did, and uh, it was a great piece of work, and, and we're pleased to be part of that. 
So we appreciate what we're all doing here today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Let me just say um, that the future of the houses, uh, the uh, ownership has hired uh, Gerald McCants Architecture to do to prepare uh, historic preservation rehabilitation uh, drawings for the uh, for the two houses. Those are those that work is under underway. Um, the intention is for the for the owner to apply for the historic ad valorem exemption, um, and 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 the reason for that is that the long term use of the of the property, as at least as currently proposed, is for those houses to uh, go back into private ownership as residences, and so that ad valorem exemption would be helpful to a future owner in terms of of, of helping to make that, those that ownership uh, affordable. So those are the, the, the next steps, assuming that you make a positive recommendation to city council. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have. Thank you. Now um, I would like to uh, ask if there is any public comment. Um, seeing none, we will now close the public hearing and ask commissioners for their comments and uh, or questions of the staff or the ownership or the agent. I just want to say excellent presentation. Ditto from what everyone said. It was r really well done and very enlightening. Oh, I second that. That was a great presentation. And I think it's... Uh, it's really important even juxtapose the, the current housing there and then the former housing in the same place um, and to see that they're the last two houses left on the row, it, it's like anchors it and it shows like, wow, there used to be multiple of these houses in this area and look how, how much has changed. So it actually shows, preserving these two homes actually shows like the progression of the area over time just because of where they are too. And I'm just, um, I'm super uh, grateful that you guys chose to keep it without it being like, you know, erased and then there's no more at all whatsoever and there's no history there. We wouldn't know what was there before if it wasn't, you know, if we didn't, um, if you guys didn't take action. So just super grateful and thank you for the presentation. Nancy? Yes, I, again, uh, incredible presentation and and I have to say that that has been my experience with um, the Historic Preservation Department at the City of Tampa. You all do an amazing amount of research and background and present it in a way that's very digestible. Um, so I just, in general, appreciate all the hard work that you all do to make this um, something that we can discuss and take action on. So thank you. Your, your microphone. Can you hear me now? All right. uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, the Johnson Brother House uh, and that area means a lot to me. Adjacent from that property on Scott Street, my grandmother attends Mount Moriah. Um, and also on the weekend, I shop at the uh, local garden down at the other end of Scott Street that I'm so happy that some of the um, property has been exchanged to things that are of, of substance. Um, you know that area, um, it is still a housing area that, and those um, type of things need to be intricated back into the area. So I'm, again, the housing authority, I've worked with you all before from process of actually being in housing and seeing what that area has looked like into what it is today. And for the, the Johnson house, to, uh, both of those homes to still be there in the shape that is in and to know that this will be put back into the community for housing, it's a great thing, especially with the housing crisis that Tampa is going through right now and for a use of low income. So I'm excited to see what those renderings would look like and to see you know this going back into a family and to be used again. And Mr. Johnson, I appreciate your stories because the same stories that you told are the same ones that my great-grandfather told. He was a part of 
of laying the brickwork for Nebraska Avenue. So I, I'm excited that the black history and the African American history um, is being retold uh, because all it takes is for a generation to forget and it is no more. So for those two homes to still be standing and to be uh, occupied in the future by a family, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. So again, thank you. I love the, um, the information that has been put together. I'm definitely saving this um, to have, because again, we don't have pictures. We do not have the Cuban clubs to show the things that African Americans have contributed to uh, to Tampa, so to be able to see this and to reproduce it so that others, so that my children and yours and, and those in the community can see it, I, this is what historic preservation is supposed to do. Yes, um, ma'am, I, I appreciate you. I got, I got 22 Could you, could you please speak? come up to the oh. microphone to speak? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. no, I'm sorry. I know I didn't. No, I was just telling her. Uh, I, I, I'm we sorry. can continue after, but I would love to hear more of your stories. No, I just said I got 22 grandchildren. They need to see and they need to know. Because if I don't tell them, they, they would never realize it. Because like me saying about this racial turmoil, that, that would keep down a lot of stuff to know where we come from and how far That's we don't right. strive and the things we have accomplished. Thank you. That's why I said I appreciate it and I, I thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Are you, we can do it. Hey, yeah, I will. We, we need a motion at this point in time. Okay. So, um, Kamaria pettis Malcolm from the legal department. There, I understand that staff did the pre presentation, correct. We need two motions for the different addresses, thank you. Okay, I would like to make the first motion for uh, HPC 2023-04 for the property at 1250 East Scott Street. Move to recommend the uh, Tampa City Council approve the request to designate 1250 East Scott Street for local landmark designation as an addition to the historic Central Avenue African American Heritage Site Multiple Property Group because the application meets the criteria established in the City of Tampa Code Section 27-257 for the following reasons. Um, for A, the building, site, structure, object, or district. Do I have to go through each? Okay. Well, we'll just A, B, and C. Uh, Maria pettis Mackle from the City Attorney's Office. I've highlighted the code section. Um, it's your um, role to determine what criteria or what criteria the application meets. So as established in code section um, 27257, subsection A1, that's one aspect, mm -hmm. and I've bolded, and you have to go through subsection two if it's your determination that it meets the criteria and determine which criteria, based upon the um, evidence that's pre been presented at this public hearing, which criteria this application meets, whether it's A1, two, criteria A, criteria B, criteria C, or criteria D. Okay. Okay. Thank you for clarification. If I just may add to that, if you refer to the staff report, mm -hmm. page two, under staff assessment and recommendations, I know that Elaine went through that pretty quick, but the third bullet point uh, summarizes what the recommendations of the staff were. All right. So we have it, uh, page two. So my recommendation would be for criteria A, the building site structure. Oh, it's a lot going on, but we are here for it. Okay. The property is associated with events that made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of our history. In regards to that, it made um, the houses are significant for their association to the scrub, uh, the segregation in African American communities and uh, it dates back to the like, late 19th century. And also it represents the type of housing in which the African American uh, lived in in that community. Is that of substance? Kamaria pettis Mackle from the city attorney's office. Um, Commissioner Cobb, I understand what you're saying, but for a, um, 
an adequate record if you could provide um, information in accordance to the code. So it's, again, I, I would encourage you to review the sample motion that was provided. Yes. And you have to state, are you only stating it meets criterion A? Are you saying it meets criterion B? Are you stating it meets criterion C? Um, the code section is um, outlined in the sample motion that you have to follow through. So again, yes. it's, are you determining that the application meets the criteria in subsection A1 and 2, mm -hmm. and then which criteria okay. under subsection 2 does the application meet? Okay. So let's take it back. Yes, I do recommend it. It's criteria A, 1, and 2, and that is what's con uh, construction and achieves in a significant during the period of historic significance and delineated in the National Registry of Historic Places, guidelines, and, or established in the uh, nomination pursuant to those guidelines. And Section 2 has a quality of significance in American state or local uh, history, architect, archaeology, engineering, and culture, which is presented in districts, sites, buildings, structures, and objects that possess integrity of location, design, settings, material, worksmanship, feelings, and association. That is criteria A, criteria B, and criteria C. Is that sufficient? You're saying that it meets criterion A, a B, B, and, and C. C. That is correct. May I have a second? Um, second. There is a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Now we need a um, motion for the second property, please, at 1248 East Scott Street. A similar type of extended motion, perhaps. <laughs> and, okay. I, and I, I apologize on that sample motion. The address is incorrect. It's 1248. Okay. And I state the address in the motion. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to accept, um, to, what is it? To, care to recommend to city council. Okay. I make a motion to uh, recommend to city, account, to city council to approve the request to designate um, 1250 East. 1248. 1248, sorry. 1248, got it. Um, East Scott Street for a local um, landmark designation as an addition to the Historic Central Avenue area, African American Heritage cites multiple property group because the application meets the criteria established in the City of Tampa Code, Section 2-257, for the following reasons. Um, that's, that's Section 27-2. Okay, 27-257? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for the following reasons. A, the building site, structure, object, or district one uh, was constructed or achieved its significance during the period of historic significance as delineated in the National Registry for Historic Places Guidelines or as, as established in the nomination pursuant to those guidelines and two, um, has a quality of significance in America or in American state or local history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, and culture, which is present um, in district sites, building structures, and objects that possess integrity of location, design, setting, material, workmanship, feeling, and association. Um, a, criterion A, uh, that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, otherwise known in Criterion A and the National Registry criteria. Um, criterion B, that are associated with the lives of persons significant in our past. 
um, and criterion C that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction or the, that represent the work of a master or that possess high artistic values or that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose uh, components may lack individual dis distinction. So I'm recommending it under these criteria. I second the motion. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. That was a tricky, tricky motion to craft. <laughs> Thank you, commissioners. I just want to take a moment to really express uh, sincere appreciation to uh, both uh, Mr. Johnson for coming out and for the representatives from the Housing Authority. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, one of my major concerns in the area uh, for years, and it's so uh, rewarding to see uh, these structures being preserved and being preserved in a way that I think are respectful to the history of the area and to the family itself. So we look forward to working uh, with the architect on uh, restoring the structures and bringing those back into their original use. I'll say one, one of the first assignments yesterday was uh, my 22nd anniversary with the city of Tampa. And uh, so one of the first, thank you. You're historic. Uh, I, I, I'm there. Uh, one of the first things I was charged with doing was researching um, Central Avenue and Perry Harvey Park for our division and I was uh, barely kind of knew my way around the office at that time and um, they told me that there was a an area where Perry Harvey Park was that was a community and I had never heard about this mm -hmm. and and I started to do research and uh, started to do pictorial research and kind of started coming across the the pictures of what Central Avenue was, and I was astonished. And mm -hmm. I went out to the site, and I stood there, and one of the most memorable parts of that uh, time was that I, I had no, I could not determine a perspective on where the area was because it was totally gone. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times I try to find a landmark and position myself in a photo, Kind of to experience what that was back in the day, and, and it was gone, and 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 started to kind of get into the research more and talk to my family members that were from Tampa. I'm from Tampa, and uh, my grandfather was actually a laundry uh, delivery man, and he had accounts in uh, in Central Avenue and in the Scrub, and I had the opportunity to talk to him a little bit about it and learn about it and and understand you know what. Uh, the impact was to that community and and to the city too because it's a city's loss and I think we all we all lose a little bit of our identity when we lose an area like that and and so I, I really got an appreciation for our existing historic resources and I think it it is a lesson I learned about respecting the past and trying to uh, balance the development of today with with our with our built history of the past. So it's uh, a wonderful, I think, item to be dealing with today. And uh, once again, our sincere appreciation as we move this along. Um, with that, I think we'll move on to our next item if it's the pleasure of the board. Yes, please. Okay. So dealing with um, the uh, conversation that we had during our May public hearing once again, I uh, wanted to provide a brief update to the East Tampa Historic Resources, and Elaine's going to set me up for this presentation here. So during our, during our previous uh, hearing, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion about the East Tampa neighborhood and about identifying and moving towards some type of preservation in this initiative in, in that area to uh, both uh, celebrate and uh, recognize and protect the uh, historic resources that exist there. 
So there's several segments I think that we, we begin with when we start to contemplate uh, historic designation in the neighborhood and, and much of that begins with um, the research and documentation that uh, is necessary to both understand the historic neighborhood and the historic areas, the people that, that uh, make that area their home and that have, have built the area and then also to, to document and to um, uh, demonstrate through the existing city processes that, that these uh, places, uh, objects, um, are worthy of historic preservation. And so as you saw with Elaine's previous pres presentation, there's an awful lot of research that goes into um, a particular subject before we're able to bring it back to you and understanding the people the places and the events of that area. And then trying to identify what the appropriate method of recognition is for a, a, a historic um, asset. Um, could be uh, local designation, might be uh, celebrating it through some of the different medias that we, we looked at in the pr prior, um, in the prior presentation through uh, public art or plaques or historic markers uh, or listing a particular uh, resource in the National Register of Historic Places either as an individual property at multiple property or a district. And so, you know, identifying what the appropriate tool is is a big part of what the staff engages in every day. The East Tampa neighborhood is, is uh, a community redevelopment area. It's actually the city's largest community redevelopment area and it's composed of 4,820 acres. Uh, there are um, a number of uh, different uh, districts and uh, both local and national. They're in the proximity of the uh, neighborhood or within. Um, just to kind of clean that up a little bit with this map kind of is, is helpful in identifying. You see a portion of the Ybor City a national landmark and local historic district uh, just in the, the lower left corner, uh, just abutting uh, the uh, Tampa Heights historic district. And then as you move north, there's the Seminole Heights historic district and the Hampton Terrace National Register district. So much of what we've been engaged in uh, really prior to the previous meeting, but since the previous meeting, is reviewing existing inventories of the area, identifying prior surveys or known historic resources. Um, that often helps us to understand other resources that may be in proximity uh, or that may have not been, they may have been identified, but there, there really hasn't been much action taken on them. Uh, we look for uh, histories, both written and oral, that may have been conducted in the area. Of course, photographs are a big, were very helpful um, and then uh, individuals uh, to interview like uh, Mr. Johnson I know we, we just grabbed his number <laughs> before he went out so uh, that's always, always very very helpful and, and and very appreciative for people that share their time with us and then there's also different types of documentation for eligible sites and structures through the Florida Master Site File System um, photography narratives and statements of significance are also also included in some of these uh, documents that uh, really, you know, give us the basis for beginning uh, further research. You can see some of, you know, what we've assembled so far. I'd mentioned the districts. There's also some local landmark structures that are, are identified or are properties listed on the National Register. Um, you know, this is an area I think that uh, we we hopefully will be able to identify more. There's, there's not an extreme amount of focus that has been played in this area other than uh, federally funded projects that have really been, uh, you know, case specific, for instance, the expansion of 275 or the expansion of Interstate 4, where there were studies done uh, under uh, the Section 106 process, or perhaps in a Section 106 process, where there's another potential impact to historic resources. Like you see in some of these illustrations, there may be um, national uh, historic district 
um, eligibility determinations based on Section 106 processes, cultural resource assessment surveys uh, that may have been uh, conducted uh, in accordance with Section 106. That could be for roadway expansions and potential impacts that might be happening because of that, like along 22nd Street corridor, or it could be uh, the introduction of cell phone towers that uh, there's required to go through a Section 106 process. Those are the, the radiuses that you see uh, on, on these maps. And then kind of turning to some of the, some of the resources that have been uh, identified in these areas, uh, there's structures that uh, do have Florida master site files. Those are documents that are recorded with the Division of Historic Resources and that really uh, delineate a particular structure and its potential eligibility for listing. Um, and then there's also uh, properties that are potentially eligible that have been identified through some of these studies but have not been locally or nationally designated. So the determination of eligibility for some of the Section 106 um, investigations is, is adequate uh, to uh, uh, respond mitig with mitigation from you know, the particular project. It's not necessary to move it towards an actual designation. It, it essentially receives the protection if it's eligible. And then looking at um, some of the recorded cemeteries uh, in, in the area, of course, I think uh, we're all f familiar with Memorial Cemetery, Memorial Park Cemetery, but also within uh, the East Tampa area, there are other cemeteries that have Florida master site files, and you see some of those in proximity uh, to the, the neighborhood as well, just outside uh, what's considered East Tampa proper with like the Zion Cemetery. So under um, the preservation uh, umbrella, uh, there's obviously different types of uh, uh, designations or listings. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places really is a tool of uh, recognition and, and uh, commemoration. Uh, there are some protective measures with it. They're mainly on projects that are federally funded, which kind of tie back to that Section 106 process. Um, where, where dollars, like for instance, say on uh, uh, in interstate expansion, are going from the federal government and through the National Historic Preservation Act, it's required that uh, you know we understand what those impacts are going to be to historic resources. And then locally, there's you know potential uh, that would apply to East Tampa as well as anywhere else in the city for individual landmark designations. Uh, for multiple property groupings, depending on, you know, what the history of a particular um, uh, resource is, if it's uh, ethnic, uh, ethnically important or architecturally important, or perhaps a mixture of different eligibility criteria. And then there's local historic district designations. And a local historic district designation, really, um, a district can be really an assemblage of three buildings or more. So uh, as we look at East Tampa, uh, you know, it may not be that you're you're looking at the entire 4,000 areas uh, acres for a district, but perhaps there's pockets within the the area that would be eligible for a district uh, more appropriately than maybe an individual listing. And so this is part of the discussion that we're looking forward to having with uh, the neighborhood as well. Here's some examples. Uh, we we've been talking a lot about the. Um, uh, resources of, of, of the African-American communities today in the city. These are some examples of local landmark designations that we have. Some of these are older, and as the program has sort of evolved and uh, preservation approaches have evolved, there's been, you know, sort of a little bit different way of managing some of the resources. Um, we created the multiple properties groups to as an assemblage that, that somewhat you know, tell the story of a particular type, you know, whether that be the bridges over the Hillsborough River, the African American Heritage Sites, or the downtown Franklin Street Corridor. Um, and prior to those multiple property groups, there was the, the approach was really to do individual landmarks. And so some of the older landmarks that we see that have been designated for quite a while um, 
are usually individually designated. It's the same protection. It's just a different way of sort of packaging those designations. And then we, we talked already about the existing African American Heritage Site, Central Avenue, uh, multiple properties listing, which we're you know, constantly trying to build upon. And, and, and what's efficient about that from our programmatic you know, approach is that we have this existing designation that we've been authorized as a staff to continue to, to add to. So uh, we're not bringing those back to you individually and getting authorization for every single landmark, which kind of adds time and a lot of times in preservation time is very important, expediency. And we're, we're kind of bringing those to you as we feel that they're eligible and you're, you're making a decision on those independently. And then of course, uh, today's presentation, as I said, we're continuing to build upon these and hopefully uh, can add many, many more. These are some of the, you know, the other approaches that perhaps uh, can be looked at for um, resources or events that don't exist anymore or that perhaps can, the story can be told through either public art or through a plaque. Uh, so there's, you know, different, um, there's different ways to expand upon the built past and be able to kind of represent that to the public now and into the future. And I think these are all options that can be looked at along the way for, you know, the appropriate uh, site or uh, building. Memorial Park Cemetery, obviously a very important uh, historic resource in the uh, East Tampa community. Um, I think it's been well publicized, but I'll kind of reiterate that the city is under contract to purchase Memorial Park Cemetery since our last meeting. Uh, that has changed. Uh, in talking with our real estate division, that they're, they're anticipated to be closing on that transaction by the end of the month. And then it's the city's intention uh, to um, seek uh, historic designation on this cemetery and in the resource uh, thereafter. So uh, once we're, we're actually already working on assembling the information for that, but once we have ownership and can get the authorization uh, to proceed on that, we'll be bringing that back to you. And then uh, there's other types, uh, I, which this is just a sort of a wonderful story and resource that we still have um, in the city of Tampa, Rogers Park Golf Course, where this has been recognized nationally, but not locally. So there's an opportunity to expand upon those original um, <coughs> listings and, and bring uh, a further local protection to them. And so when, when, I, when I last met, I was scheduled to appear at the East Tampa uh, uh, Community Advisory Committee subcommittee, the Aesthetics and Beautification, on May 9th. Uh, unfortunately, I was informed that that meeting was canceled. And so I had spoke with um, the CRA manager at that time, and I said, well, look, I really kind of want to keep this moving along. And so what we agreed was, was to um, uh, just kind of elevate it and, and for me to have an opportunity to go back to the actual uh, community advisory committee itself and not the subcommittee on June 6th. And so I'll be, um, I'll be attending that meeting. You see the, uh, the location, the time, and the place here. And I believe that that's also on the, the, CA, the CRA uh, website. And uh, we'll continue to update you uh, as we make progress on this. But I think uh, given uh, the acquisition of, of Memorial Park Cemetery and some of the efforts that we've kind of been going over today, you see that there's some momentum here that we definitely want to keep going and, uh, and hopefully make some progress in, in the East Tampa area. So with that, I'm open to any questions you might have. And there may be some public here to comment on this as well. Well, I am, uh, have to express my appreciation for the thoroughness and the perseverance that you have exhibited in pursuing uh, this new adventure for the, the commission so, and, and for the city of Tampa. And we look forward to more information as it, as it unfolds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ready to move along? Or? Yeah, I um, now uh, uh, Miss 
Ms. pettis Mackle, is now uh, an appropriate time to uh, ask for public comment? Sure. If there's anyone who wants to provide public comment, we're writing this up. Okay. If there is anyone in the uh, audience who would like to come forward, please state your name and address and... Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Ray Reed, 1421 Hilton Place, Old Seminole Heights, Tampa, Florida, 33604. And I was asked to speak with you today by Ms. Eileen Henderson. That's Eileen with an A. Uh, she's at 914 West Fribley Street, Tampa, 33603, and is unfortunately on the mend and could not physically be here and felt it was important enough that not an email would suffice. Eileen's the founder of the Cemetery Society of Florida not-for-profit, of which I too am a proud member. And we want to take this opportunity to introduce the Cemetery Society to you. We would like to work with the commission, staff, historians, anyone, um, all things cemetery here in the city of Tampa. We're an ever-growing group of Tampa area residents dedicated to the beautification, education, restoration, and preservation of Tampa's historic cemeteries. We came into being after spearheading the campaign. Anyone remember Save Woodlawn Cemetery? Against a developer wanting to build on Woodlawn Cemetery property. That campaign met with success when Tampa City Council voted unanimously not to rezone the property so developers would not be able to build upon established cemetery lands. We're also the group that sounded the alarm to the purchase of the Memorial Park Cemetery by a property flipper. Together, with friends of Belmont Heights Memorial Park Cemetery, we're pleased to see yet another unanimous vote by Tampa City Council, approving the city of Tampa's purchase of that cemetery, which uh, Dennis just referenced. Moving forward, we plan on taking a more active role in Tampa's history and its documentation, with the primary focus on its cemeteries. What our end game right now is we want to establish National Historic Landmark status for all qualifying Tampa cemeteries. And we have dedicated researchers and volunteers to see this goal come to fruition. We also have a special focus on preserving and promoting Tampa's diverse history, with an emphasis on our black and African American history that has been erased, systematically marginalized, pushed aside, carelessly changed, and or forgotten. And I'm going to tell you, folks, after I'm the crazy guy for four years until I got Paul Guzzo's ear about Zion Cemetery, telling people about all our race cemeteries and thousands of people that I've read their death certificates on. The history of Tampa, we've documented that much of it. These people that we've erased in their burial sites, the stories that they bring forward, that you can, through documentation, even in newspapers, um, things that should be named for people and names that should be known by every child, white, black, brown, or green in Tampa today that have been buried and built upon. We look forward to a positive working relationship with this commission, current and future administration and staff within the city of Tampa. And uh, <coughs> I thought I was a lone wolf until I saw these signs when I came back from out of state and I said, what's this say Woodlawn? And I met Eileen and I met some of the folks there. You've got a powerful group of people and we've got an awful lot to share. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Hallie Reed. I live at 2059 Ronald Circle in Sefner. Uh, today, I am asking for a uh, national landmark resignation for Woodlawn Memorial Park and Marti Colon cemeteries. In the last three years alone, all of these cemeteries have faced incidents of real estate developers trying to buy, sell, or build on parts of them. These sacred places need every layer of protection that they can get. Personally, I've done extensive research into the potter's field at Woodlawn and the, the number of burials at Memorial Park. Since its designation in 1895, the potter's field at Woodlawn has changed locations and gone through several expansions. There are about 3,000 people buried at the potter's field. And I believe burials were conducted in several different locations at different times, with sec sections segregated by race and by adults and infants. 
but I don't know where these sections are. There also remains the issue of a unique section designated in 1900 for black burials that has never been fully identified or resolved. Regarding Memorial Park, while it is understood that there are no more open plots remaining for sale, the exact number of burials there is unknown. Last summer, I tried to document as many burials as I could using publicly available resources. Using death certificates from 1920 to 1939 on FamilySearch.com and obituaries scanned from the Florida Sentinel Bulletin archives at the C. Blythe Andrews Jr. Library, I documented about 15,000 burials. Unfortunately, this number is incomplete because there is a large gap from when the death certificates end in 1939 and when the obituaries begin in 1958. I have no way of counting the burials from then. However, I can make an estimate, and I believe the total number of burials at Memorial is close to 20,000. In both of these cemeteries, I would like to request a ground penetrating radar search to help answer these questions. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Noreen Copeland Miller, and I'm the founder of the Friends of Valmer Heights Memorial Park Cemetery. I'm here this morning because when I saw the agenda about the update for the East Tampa community, I was one interested to see exactly and hear and be here in person to see the updates. And I'm glad that the cemetery, Memorial Park Cemetery, as they said, was there. And as I listened to that, and we look at the demographics, and we continue to say East Tampa, remember, it's Bama Heights Memorial Park Cemetery. And I, I was listening to the history here, and as uh, Mr. Fernandez was talking about uh, the historical destinations, and of course, Ebor, Seminole Heights, Hamilton Terrace, but we never say Bama Heights. So I really hope that you all put some effort in knowing and. And I think you'll find some really historical th things in the Belma Heights area in that neighborhood, which is a Memorial Park Cemetery with a lot of rich history that we have suddenly erased Belma Heights. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about it. And I listened to this lady on a great presentation with her historical facts telling my story. I'm a fifth generation in Tampa. I used to go to the Lincoln Theater on Central Avenue to, um, uh, Moses White Chicken Place and the other things there. So I'm like, but who would know it was there? Because you couldn't find the exact area. I walked down Central with my family. And we're erasing black history in this city. So we got to do better, and I got to be a better steward of my history. We have a lot of people move here, don't know about the rich history that blacks have contributed in this city. We forget that, but one thing in the cemetery, that history is there. And I can tell you, a lot of people that own stuff, businesses on Central Avenue and other black communities in this city are buried in Belma Heights Memorial Park Cemetery. It's 800, over 800 military, Negro military soldiers in that cemetery from World War I and II, and possibly from the Korean War. But the bottom line is this, who would know? I'm very grateful for having an opportunity to, to be a part of the Cemetery Society because the lead researcher, Ms. Hallie, has done a great job with researching. And Ray Reed done a great job with the research. But just to have their support and bring me up, and, and I've learned a lot about the cemetery that I didn't know. So I'm hoping that it be a landmark designation, local and nationally, at some point. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, I will now close the uh, public hearing. Or Dennis, would you like to make any other further comment? I guess I, that's probably the more appropriate order of things here. Well, um, thank you once again, Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Thank you all for coming out today. I know this is at the end of the agenda, so it's been a long morning for, for these folks. Uh, I, I just want to say we're very open to collaborating with the society. Before you leave, we'll definitely get your contact information. And as we move, uh, you know, 
these cemeteries through our process, we certainly want to learn and be able to represent the history and you know the events correctly. So uh, we we look forward to that collaboration. Um, as you know, the uh, the city itself, uh, its process is a local designation process. Uh, the state of Florida uh, is the uh, essentially vehicle by which national register or national landmark uh, designations are applied for. So we can certainly coordinate on these designations. And I think with them, uh, as I said, it brings, uh, you know, both recognition and protection when we're able to accomplish both. And that's, I think, a, a, an important thing. Um, so with that, I believe that can, that concludes my update and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I, I think it's important for, for these folks to understand that national re, uh, recognition does not provide the same protection level as does the local landmark status. Mm -hmm. So as you pursue uh, your efforts be, be sure not to leave out the local landmarking aspect of this um, so that your, your goals for protection are, are accomplished. Uh, anyone else have a comment? Hi, yes, thank you uh, staff uh, and Dennis for the research for East Tampa and following up so quickly uh, and gathering the resources uh, to prepare um, for the meeting for June the 6th. Um, I definitely will be in attendance and hopefully the community uh, can um, be in attendance to provide other information because again, when you, there's no uh, physical structure, oral is the next th best thing. So um, also I would, implore the city of Tampa to also work with USF. Uh, recently, USF um, social, I, I don't have the correct name, but their social um, department has been working with e uh, East Tampa not only to work on the historic perspective, but also the water and quality content. But during that time, they were interviewing um, what we call the jazzy seniors. Those are the seniors who've been in East Tampa for a long time. And some of their oral history, um, I was able to be a part of that research. Um, I was able to find out some information and landmarks I've never heard of, mm -hmm. especially on that 20, uh, 29th Street corridor and MLK. Um, so maybe tapping into their resources to get some of that information or seeing if they can be a part of that meeting to sure. share uh, that information. Because I believe uh, over 60 individuals showed up to tell um, and share some of their um, perspective and uh, give some account on the you know, urban renewal for this area as well. So, uh, so, so was that through the, the library system? No, or? USF. Uh, um, I can share that contact yeah, with you, you but they, yeah. uh, the last few months uh, they've been working close with East Tampa, so it's still relatively new. Sure. Um, and East Tampa is uh, in that area. We're actually having a neighborhood association meeting on the 18th. Uh, where others from that uh, area will be in attendance as well. So I'm, I'm big for a community because if, if sure. we don't know, how would we know? Right. So uh, if we can connect as much as possible, that would be great. Sure, uh, absolutely. Excellent. I think that concludes for um, the East Tampa update. Um, the date and uh, next time, just as a reminder for uh, our commissioners, the next meeting date has been changed. It is now July 11, 2023 at 9 a.m. In, in these chambers. And um, is there any other new business that uh, anyone would like to bring up at this time? Yes. Um, I. I was wondering if at our next meeting we might have a update on legislation that may have been passed and I really don't know the answer. Um, I, I was tracking things up until the last week and I knew there were some uh, threatening um, pieces of legislation that were moving quickly that had direct or indirect historic preservation impacts. Mm -hmm. 
n not in a positive way. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering if that was something that you could brief us on, even if the answer is none of those scary things passed, that would be fine. <laughs> um, I really haven't kept up with it, and I think not only for my edification, but I don't think it would hurt um, to have the public know it for the masses that watch our meetings. <laughs> so I actually had a request from another uh, commissioner, Commissioner Shoecraft. The, there's been quite a buzz in the world of preservation over the last couple of months uh, related to some activity coming out of Tallahassee. So I have a, a I have one of those um, particular pieces of legislation to review with you today, and and then and if there are others that you know we we, we can certainly bring those back. So if if it's the pleasure of the board, I'll go ahead and and, and go ahead and do that now. Yes, please. Okay. okay, if we can go to the PowerPoint, I have some slides to kind of assist you. So uh, this may be one of the pieces of legislation that you were referring to, Commissioner, but uh, the, the one that, that certainly kind of uh, took, took the wind out of the sail uh, in the state of Florida for preservation was the proposed um, bill by Senator Avila in the Miami-Dade area uh, and Representative, Representative Roach in uh, North Fort Myers. And it was came in uh, under uh, House Bill 1317, and then it's its companion bill, Senate Bill 1346. And as introduced, uh, it, it, that you know, the, this is sort of a broad level description. Uh, it was to create the Resilience, Resiliency and Safety, Safe Structures Act, which would prohibit local governments from prohibiting, restricting, or preventing demolition of certain structures unless necessary for public safety. Um, the, the original bill did not apply to single family structures uh, or structures that were individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, there were other exemptions that were added over time, but as introduced, the bill overrode local government's limits on demolishing uh, or preventing demolition of structures in coastal areas, uh, those that did not uh, comply with FEMA requirements, and particularly FEMA requirements are, ele are elevational requirements, and it's pretty um, widespread that most historic structures do not uh, comply with uh, FEMA requirements. <laughs> so uh, you can see that there was uh, it was a quite alarming that the the legislation that was being um, proposed overrode local government limits uh, both on preventing demolitions and on how those structures could be replaced. Um, so we were locally looking at areas that would have impacted us uh, within um, significant portions of Ybor City, predominantly everything along the river, uh, uh, large sections of the Hyde Park Historic District and um, all of Davis Islands, large portions of Palmetto Beach National Register Historic District. So there was, it, was, it would have had a, a, you know, that's just our community. It, it, you know, this is a, all along the coast of Florida, um, very significant along St. Pete area, uh, along Miami-Dade area. As amendments were added, there were exclusions to single family structures that were, were um, introduced. And then there was a caveat if it was uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but individually listed, not as a district. Most of, mm -hmm. our, most of our district designations, um, there's a kind of a approach to preservation that if you have a district designation, it's not necessary to seek an individual designation because they both result in the same effect. But this certainly was a caveat that was un unanticipated. And then uh, there were further exclusions about um, municipalities with less than 10,000 population or those that had structures that were constructed more than 200 years ago. And you can see as that was being tailored, there was, uh, you know, smaller uh, communities uh, like Apalachicola or Pensacola and then uh, more museum towns like St. Augustine. They're trying to take, take it away because the real... Um, 
focus for these particular um, legislators was the South Beach area. That's where their real target was, but it, their wording was much uh, further. Um, and then, uh, you know, there was other discussion about perhaps if a structure came down that it would still have to go through a public hearing process uh, to, to be reconstructed, but then that reconstructed structure would be compliant with FEMA and potentially could be out of character with its surrounding structures. So that was, that was the general overview that had most of the preservationists in Florida and, and many, you know, people that were worried about heritage tourism and impacts on, on uh, the, the Florida coast, you know, very alarmed. Uh, as the, the re refined area, the last proposal was that it, it apply along coastal construction control lines, which you see this map indicates the coastal construction control lines. Uh, Tampa does not uh, have these control lines, so the last version of this as it went into the Senate excluded the Tampa area, but obviously impacted many communities uh, in Florida. And um, essentially what happened was this bill uh, never made it out of the House. It died in the House. And so it was not, it was not voted upon. It did, it did however, um, uh, I think get uh, most people in the state thinking about, you know, future proposed legislation. And the trend that we're seeing in Florida is, is obviously more redevelopment friendly, more density driven uh, land use regulations that is being somewhat facilitated through the state legislature. So I think it's, it's an important, you know, example, uh, one, just one segment of, of, of land use issues that are going on right now that place additional pressures on historic preservation and really uh, result in a, a need to um, monitor these and stay engaged and stay active. We work through, um, we have a legislative liaison for the city of Tampa that I was working closely with. Uh, there's also groups like the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation and I was coordinating with the State Historic Preservation Office on this, as were many, many, uh, you know, other similar municipalities throughout the state. So uh, I, I believe that was one of the, the um, proposed legislative measures that was going through. Um, there were others that were incentives to preservation. One, one was, a, uh, was a state tax credit that was being proposed that was similar to the federal tax credit that exists that we we utilize and it's very valuable for historic preservation uh, projects but however that that failed to get passed as well so while we we did not have a you know this this degradation of local control over historic resources passed we also didn't have an incentive that it could be used to promote historic preservation um, so it's 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 a, a, that's unfortunate we were hopeful that that could pass and be another tool in our kit uh, to encourage uh, preservation locally uh, and statewide. Okay. So I think that concludes my pres presentation. Thank you, Dennis, so much. I really appreciate it. It was kind of last minute, my request. Um, I do have uh, two follow-up questions. Um, one is the coastal construction control line. I'm looking at the... Um, the figure right now. So are you saying that includes, when you say the Tampa Bay area, I assume that means St. Pete, Safety Harbor, you know, basically anybody who's got property along a waterway, is, is that, that's what that's saying. Okay. And it, then, it excludes uh, Tampa, Tampa okay. Bay, but it, it includes those coastal areas, like those barrier islands. So like St. Pete Beach? St. Pete okay, Beach, Okay, I see, yeah. but basically yeah. I'm looking, I don't see like downtown St. Pete, yeah. for example. No, no, it would okay. be, yeah. So the second question, and maybe this is something you can answer, um, when, let, let's pretend this had, this had passed, for example, and I would assume that there would be a challenge to this. When it passes, does the law go into effect immediately, even if there's a challenge to it? Mario Pettismacher from the city attorney's office. It depends on the effective date that's provided in the bill itself. Okay. And it depends on when the governor signs it also. So there's a timeline process to the legislation that's proposed. So some bills are effective immediately upon it being um, passed. Um, some uh, have an effective date being uh, in effect as of 
July 1st, for example. So it just depends. Mm -hmm. And But once a bill is challenged, let's say it goes into effect, right, immediately. Once a bill is challenged, um, does that put a stop to the bill until it gets resolved in the courts or? I don't know the answer to that, but I could pro uh, provide that update um, if it is the pleasure of the commission to have additional legislative update um, information provided. I could provide that information at the ne next meeting. It, it would be for me. That, Thank okay. you. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that would be yeah. good because I, no, please. did you answer both of them? Yes, ma'am, I took care of both. Thank you. So I really appreciate that. That was the, you know, this, the most scary bill and um, that was direct. And I do think um, once, hopefully not, when we read all the preemption bills um, that were passed and um, even the 99 page affordable housing bill, which I'm, I, for 40 years I, and my specialty was affordable housing in grad school, but there are a lot of uh, perhaps intended consequences for some, mm -hmm. uh, but I think for some of us unintended consequences um, and things in that bill that once everybody works through, hopefully not, but those pressures, again, may, they're not maybe speaking to historic preservation, but they're pressures for redevelopment with the, the one line in that bill that says uh, you can build certain affordable housing on co any commercially zoned property and you can do it at the height of the highest height in the city within one mile it's some crazy <laughs> crazy Word. thing and that's you know again it's indirect but those are things that I think an awareness as you said of those things so I, I wouldn't once we all get to read the I read the 99 pages of that bill and there's a lot of things in there that either we either, either we don't know the interpretation of yet or really hasn't sunk in so maybe by next month we'll all have more time and that would be helpful. Re relatedly, but it hasn't been mentioned that, and more positively, they did pass an African-American cemetery bill that uh, That's correct. presumably the governor will sign. So if we can add that to the legislative sure. update because yes. it relates to the previous discussion. Sure. Any other comments? Then I think we've taken care of our new business uh, section. Um, Ms. Pettis Mackle, in terms of receiving and filing submitted documents, do these uh, sample? That was just for the information for the board. Okay, these do not fall into that category. So there are no uh, submitted documents or exhibits that we've received today, so. You, you did have um, exhibits for the applications that were on the agenda. So if you could still have a motion to receive okay. and file. So may I ask, please, a motion to uh, receive and file submitted documents. Make a motion to receive uh, files and submitted documents and exhibit to commission. Second. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Um, the next item on our agenda is the election of officers for the ensuing year. Um, there are, if you could brief us, Dennis, there are several of us who, whose terms are expiring, including myself, so um, we will need to move forward with uh, those candidates whose terms will be ongoing sure. and, and go from that point. Uh, yes, uh, thank you once again, Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Uh, here for the election of officers, which is delineated in your rules of procedure for each year that, that there is an election to be held uh, for your officers. And as uh, your chairperson just um, uh, revealed <laughs> that she is uh, in her final month of her uh, second and a half term, uh, and that uh, essentially is the maximum allowed to be uh, served. So um, uh, we'll, we, she is allowed to continue to serve 
until a replacement uh, can be identified. But um, that is uh, your decision as to if that is appropriate for a chairperson's uh, seat. But uh, we, we uh, will um, have a few of our fellow commissioners leaving us within the year for the similar situations, uh, such as uh, Commissioner Shoecraft, whose term is up in September, and uh, <coughs> Commissioner Ortiz, who is not here today, but uh, her term will be up in uh, uh, October. And um, on the more positive side, I did want to congratulate uh, Commissioner Kanch, who was just reappointed at the last city council hearing for another term. Uh, so thank you for your willingness to serve. And uh, we look forward to working with you all the way to 2026. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another congratulations for the upcoming hearing this Thursday for Commissioner Cobb, uh, who has uh, now uh, applied for a reappointment to her, her second term as well. And I believe is scheduled on the agenda this Thursday at city council for that. So in anticipation of our, um, our exits and our reappointments, I, I entered into uh, a call for nominations of your chairperson for the upcoming year. And how I would uh, normally uh, do this is accept a nomination uh, from the members of the board, ask that individual if they're willing to serve in that capacity for the next year, and then take a vote uh, on the, the nominations that we have. So do I have any nominations for the position of chairperson? Uh, yes, I would like to nominate uh, Commissioner Cobb as the um, chairperson for the board. Thank you. S second. And does Commissioner Cobb agree to serve in that capacity for the next year? Commissioner Cobb agrees to serve in the capacity as chair for historic preservation. Thank you. And are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing none, if I could show a, a vote of hands uh, for affirmation of that nomination. Okay, it's unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and now uh, for the uh, uh, position of uh, vice chairperson, uh, the same process. Any nominations uh, for that particular position? I would like to nominate Commissioner Kench. I would like to second the nomination. We have a nomination for Commissioner Kanch for the vice chair position. Do you uh, agree to serve in that capacity for the next year? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I would like to serve in the position as vice chair Thank you. of the Historic Preservation Commission. Appreciate that. Are there any other nominations? Okay, seeing none, uh, by show of hands to affirm that nomination. Very good. Congratulations. Uh, we will set some time up with our legal counsel to have somewhat of an orientation on these positions. And I do appreciate uh, Commissioner Salaga's uh, role as chairperson since uh, I believe it was the late 2018 when you were appointed to that position. Mm -hmm. And it's been a wonderful experience for, I think, the commission and for the staff to work with you. We really appreciate that. Thank you. So on that note, I believe that our business for today is completed and the um, meeting is now adjourned. It is approximately 11-12. <clears throat>